Um, so I think we've got everyone here. So we'll uh, start with the proceedings, if that's okay with everyone. I hope I'm audible to everyone. Okay, great. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you're joining us from the world. Uh, on behalf of Islamabad Policy Research Institute, I, Umar Farooq Khan, welcome you all to today's distinguished lecture titled Rise of Nationalism, the Future of Democracy in the Global Age. Today's distinguished lecture will be delivered by Dr. Maya Tudor. She is Associate Professor of Government and Public Policy in the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. She has held fellowships at Harvard University's Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs, Oxford University's Center for the Study of Inequality and Democracy. Before embarking on an academic career, she worked as a special assistant to Chief Economist Joseph Stiglitz at the World Bank, at UNICEF, and the United States Senate, and at the Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Tudor. Uh, we are also delighted to have with us two esteemed discussants who will, who will be contributing uh, to the deliberation of today's lecture. Uh, the first discussant is Dr. Neelofer Siddiqui. She is an assistant professor of political science at the University at Albany, a State University of New York. Her research interests uh, include political parties, political violence, and the politics of religion and ethnicity. She has a PhD from Yale University, an MA from the Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies, and a BA from Haverford College. Dr. Siddiqui will also be moderating the proceedings of today's session. Thank you for being with us, ma'am. Um, second up is Mr. Ijaz Heather, a renowned South Asian affairs analyst and journalist. He is executive editor at Indus News. He was a Ford scholar at the program in arms control, disarmament, and international security at the University of Illinois and a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institute, Washington, DC. Thank you for being with us, sir. Uh, to commence the webinar, I will request Brigadier Rashid Wali Janjua, Acting President Ipri, for his welcome remarks. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Omar. Uh, a very warm welcome to uh, Dr. Tudor, uh, Ijaz Hadar, and Rilofar. We are uh, honored that you have joined us on this uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. Now, uh, I'll not say much before uh, we hear Dr. Tudor, and uh, I hope that uh, we have a very engaging and absorbing discussion. The linkage between uh, nationalism and democracy is uh, something that evokes a lot of interest because uh, both things, according to some scholars, are antithetical, and according to some scholars, uh, they are complementary. The world history has seen some very interesting interactions between the two concepts. We know as history evolved in front of us in 1917, the socialist uh, nationalism and its uh, clash with the Bolshevik nationalism and how Bolshevik nationalism ultimately morphed into communism. And when the communism gave way, it was the era of liberal democracy, got its apotheosis in the shape of uh, Fukuyama's famous statement, clash of civilization, that now it's the end of uh, history and the liberal democracy is the last big idea. Now, uh, as we have, I'll give an analogy of in very simple terms, there are bad nationalisms and there's a good nationalism, just like we have a bad cholesterol and uh, a good cholesterol. So the good nationalism, it complements democracy and the bad nationalism, it detracts from it. And we are seeing the manifestation of several uh, movements, social uh, activist movements, which morph into political movements, but for want of a uh, greater ability to organize, they remain outliers. And ultimately, uh, they create more anarchy. And uh, we have some examples. We uh, see in a neighborhood in India, uh, the Hindu, the Hindutva nationalism that has morphed into a political ideology. So that's a kind of a nationalism which is, uh, uh, you know, obtruding constraints upon the ability of democracy to be more inclusive. So this exclusivism versus inclusivism debate is all about uh, the interaction of these two concepts. And I'm looking forward to a very engaging and absorbing discussion as we have some very eminent panelists. Uh, with these few words, I invite uh, Dr. Tudor to uh, please enlighten us with our views. 
Over to you, Dr. Tudor. Uh, so um, I will now pass the virtual floor to Dr. Nilofar Siddiqui to commence with the proceedings of today's lecture. Over to you, Dr. Nilofar. Great, thank you so much. Uh, well, thanks for that introduction. Uh, I'm incredibly excited to be both moderate, moderating and serving as a discussant at this event today. In addition to, of course, the esteemed company, I think the topic, which is up for discussion, um, as just mentioned, is a particularly important one. The relationship between nationalism and democracy could really not be more timely, as we are seeing what appears to be a rise in nationalist sentiment, the election of populist leaders on nationalist platforms in many countries around the world. So this in turn raises a number of theoretical and empirical questions about the very concept of nationalism and also its effect on democracy. And so I'm hoping that we can get into some nitty gritty, um, some of the nitty gritty of these concepts uh, in our conversation, both theoretically, but also by examining the cases in South Asia with which we um, and perhaps our audience are most familiar. So I wanted to uh, get us started by asking you, Dr. Tudor, um, to tell us a bit more about your current project. So you have written, um, and I'll quote you, uh, there's a strong case to be made that nationalism is the most powerful political ideology in the world today. You have also written, there is a presumption on the part of many politicians and academics that nationalism is intrinsically bad. But you argue that nationalism can as much help build up democracy as it can undermine it. So can you tell us a little bit about what you think that the existing literature on nationalism has missed and what gaps your argument is filling? Thank you, Dr. Siddiqui. And before I start, I just wanna say um, a big thank you to IPRI for organizing this event. Um, I do think it's so topical and um, to Ajaz, who um, I'm seeing now after many years to, to, to uh, both you and, and Dr. Siddiqui for, for hosting the event. Um, it's a delight to be virtually in Pakistan if I can't be there um, uh, in, in person. So um, I, I do believe that nationalism is perhaps one of the um, most powerful political resources out there in the world today. And if you look around the political science literature, um, there just hasn't been a lot of research on nationalism, not that's comparative and that takes the phenomenon seriously in a comparative sense. So if you look, the vast majority of research on nationalism has been of a single country. And um, as, as uh, some, some have, of you have already said, you know, nationalism is like good cholesterol or bad cholesterol, or it's, and I, I might use a different analogy. I might say, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit like, it's a resource like an airplane. You know, an airplane can be used to ferry um, water to drought stricken areas, of the world, or it can be um, used to fly, um, you know, terrorists into skyscrapers. It can be used for a range of things, um, but it can't be wished away. We live in a world of nation states, and um, just over 40 years ago, Fukuyama wrote in the, that end of history article that's already also been mentioned that history is over because there's no longer any real ideological battle out there. Liberalism democracy, capitalism have won, and these kind of parochial identities of nationalism well progressively fall by the wayside. Well, fast forward on 40 years and not so much um, has, has that prediction come to pass. And I think what we're, we're living in a time where we are in the politically. And so the study of nationalism, I think, needs to come more front and center. Now to your question, what is my current research project on? Um, it's on exactly that question. When is nationalism good for democracy and when is it not good for democracy? And the core of uh, Long Bangladesh, Myanmar, um, is that democracy, many nationalism, and uh, 
intensity. It becomes dramatic in democracy. Now, this is not a pr prediction. Not in every case will democracy fall by the wayside where, the, where you have national identities that are built on religion or ethnicity. But it does get a tendency for democracy to wither and to die in moments of crisis. And let me just say one more sentence about that logic and then I'll, I'll pass it back to you. And that is, that is the logic is this. If you take as for example, Myanmar has happened in Myanmar, religion, Buddhism and ethnicity, Bamar, the Bamar ethnicity and make it the center of what it means to belong to the nation. Then in moments of crisis, or in moments where political entrepreneurs want to manufacture a crisis, those political entrepreneurs can point to groups that are not central to the national imagination and scapegoat them. Because democracy definitionally um, involves a, a range of political and civil liberties, when minorities systematically have this, their civil and political liberties undermined, then democracy does begin to wither and in some cases die. So that's the kind of logic of the argument that I'm developing. Hey, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Chair, you cut out for just a minute over there. So if you, it's, um, so if you wouldn't mind just recapitulating a little bit what you were saying about um, about the role of nationalism, nationalist ideology vis-a-vis -vis the role of religion and ethnicity. I think you were giving an example in Myanmar and we just lost you for a minute there. You know what, you just cut out there. So you want me to just say that again? Yes. Can you, you hear me right. all right? We yes. can hear you now. Um, good, good, good. Um, so the, the, when a national identity builds, absorbs fundamentally the building block of fixed identity, and that can be race, and it can be religion, and it can be ethnicity. But what matters is that those identities are fixed. In the context of South Asia, you can't decide to become Hindu. You can't decide to convert from you know, Shia to, to Sunni. Um, so when you take fixed identities and you make them central to the national imagining, you automatically create second class citizens. And those are groups that are not central to the national imagining. And because those lines are fixed, you create whole groups of people who are more readily scapegoated in times of crisis. And not only that, you actually create opportunities for, for groups, organizations, like in the case of Myanmar, the Burmese military, the Tatmada, to come around and say, to create crises where groups get targeted as being the problem. And then a politics, which in my view should ideally be about who gets what, and really about the getting of what and the development of, of, of a society and economy becomes about um, uh, who is a threat to whom. And that is very, um, I think, unpromising developmental uh, place for uh, the politics of any country to be in. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, so Ijaz Saab, if I could turn to you, um, if you could offer some thoughts as to what Dr. Tudor just said. In particular, do you agree that whether nationalism is inclusive or whether it's exclusive and built on these fixed identities, whether this is the key to its relationship to, to democracy? Um, and maybe a little bit about what, under what circumstances you think that nationalism can be a force for good, if at all. Uh, but at the very basic, 
Uh, sorry, Ijaz, uh, can me. I interrupt you for a second? Sorry, I think there is a little bit um, of echo in the volume. Um, I don't know if I'm Hold the on. only one hearing it, but I think. Okay. Uh, okay. That's is this better now? It's perfect. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. 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 So I was saying that essentially, uh, you know, nationalism is an imagined idea. I mean, it was Benedict Anderson talked about imagined communities. And we also know that we nourish the idea through various means. Uh, what Renner described as the relationship between remembering and forgetting. Uh, there are myths and memories of the nation. So in essence, you try to keep the flock together, but you also try to, and this implicitly and sometimes explicitly, keep it distinct from others. And so it's like, you know, falling back on what Reno said is almost like a daily referendum because uh, you want to unite disparate peoples. And uh, often, though not always, that nationalism is begotten of uh, violence, some, sometimes terrible violence. So keeping the flock together becomes an existential exercise, it becomes an ex existential imperative. But I also want to uh, identify another thing, which because we're talking about nationalism and juxtaposing it with democracy, and we're talking about whether it actually helps democracy uh, or otherwise. Uh, in speaking of democracy, uh, today, uh, we tend to forget that it isn't and wasn't the same thing as liberalism, uh, or more specifically, constitutional liberalism. So democracy, pure and simple, and there are a number of places where it's being practiced, regardless of its form, is just about numbers. Uh, the majority, uh, the minority or the minorities do not matter uh, in a democracy per se. So we developed the hybrid uh, liberal democracy, and uh, there's no pun here because we keep talking about a hybrid system currently in place in Pakistan, but liberal democracy itself is a hybrid, which goes to show that not all hybrids are bad. So it's a, a system that safeguards individual groups and minorities from being bulldozed, uh, if you will, by majority. But then we have also seen that there has been a tension within liberalism with respect to the idea of liberty on one side and the idea of equal rights on the other side. So we're talking about two concepts uh, in which problems in here, and once you try and juxtapose them and try to look at the dialectic between these two, you realize that the problems become even more complicated. So, you know, I mean, we can discuss it further in terms of, uh, of how this, these two concepts have evolved. Uh, and and that's, that's something that you and uh, Dr. Tudor know far better than I do. But I think my initial thoughts would be that uh, tensions in here within these ideas in and of themselves and also uh, when you create a dialectic between them. Great, thank you. Yeah, those are really important points. Um, I think this unpacking not only of nationalism, which we have started to do, but unpacking of the very concept of democracy is obviously really important. Um, so I will uh, step in here to offer some of my own thoughts um, and I'll, I'll keep the focus on, on nationalism, but I do want to um, circle back to talking a li little bit more about what the concept of democracy entails. So, um, you know, just thinking about this idea of inclusive versus exclusive nationalism, I, I totally entirely agree this idea that nationalism as a concept is multidimensional, right? And so this idea that nationalism can be used as an exclusive, inclusive force um, for good is I think an important one. And, and to a large extent, as you pointed out, Dr. Tudor has been like underemphasized, particularly not only in the literature, but it just in the way we talk about nationalism and as you know something not to be aspired to necessarily. Um, I wonder though, and I'm going to, I'm gonna, um, posit my thoughts and I, then I want both of your feedback or um, remarks or reactions to this. I wonder if even inclusive nationalism has its limits and whether proposing or propagating the idea of one's inherent superiority, which is fundamentally what nationalism is about and based on these artificial borders of an imagined community can nonetheless have unintended effects, particularly for minority groups um, within nation states. So um, I'll just touch a little bit on some research that I have done and in the process of doing, um, and then um, and then again, I, I love to hear your thoughts on this. So um, the first um, 
research project that I had started to do a few years ago, I was thinking about the ways in which a shared national identity, when emphasized, can increase tolerance towards marginalized communities within that nation. And so this is somewhat similar to this idea of inclusive nationalism based on not a fixed identity necessarily, but on an ideal or a value, but it's, it's not entirely the same. So I was thinking more in terms of work from social psychology, which builds upon the idea of this common in-group identity model, right? So the power stemming from the very existence of a superordinate identity to which all the sub-identities belong. So for example, you may be Hindu or you may be Muslim, but you are also both Indian. And so being Indian encapsulates these sub-identities. And so research has shown that by making the shared identity salient, so in this case, making the Indian identity salient, even in a relatively muted way. So for example, um, so uh, Singh and co-authors found that even showing people the picture of an Indian flag, which is a relatively you know, light prime, I think, can increase tolerance of domestic outgroups. And so in research I have done at Baksan, I similarly found that highlighting a marginalized community's contribution to Baksan's national prestige can increase tolerant attitudes towards that community. And so this is all really encouraging news, right? So if we can create this notion of a shared identity to which all the different groups within a community belong, if that can increase our approach to these minority groups, that's good news. But I found that this effect only existed for groups who already had high baseline uh, levels of nationalism. So among groups that felt themselves to be outside of the national mainstream, whether they were ethnic minorities or sectarian minorities or religious minorities, I didn't find the same effect. And so nowadays I'm also doing some research with um, a po uh, Asfan Diarmir, who's a postdoc at Stanford University. And we are looking at examining how different types of nationalism can affect belief in misinformation and misinformation, particularly about um, state prowess or um, attitudes towards foreign states. Um, and then importantly for the discussion here, attitudes towards domestic minority groups. And in devising this project, and we know that misinformation is a problem in Pakistan, it's a, it's a problem in India, it's a problem in the United States, right? It's a problem in a lot of places and it's contributing a lot to democratic backsliding as well. Um, so we distinguish in our project between, again, different kinds of nationalisms. So we argue that these nationalisms are not necessarily mutually exclusive, they may be overlapping, but they, um, we seek nonetheless to emphasize different aspects of national identity. So one example is of um, chauvinistic nationalism, we call it, which emphasizes a nation's material or non-material strength and superior superiority vis-a-vis -vis another foreign state. So it's aimed at countering the threat posed by an external outgroup. So in the case of Pakistan, perhaps India, right? And in contrast to this, we uh, introduce this concept of uh, what we call cohesive nationalism. And here, instead of focusing on the external outgroup, we focus on the integration of diverse groups into one superordinate national identity again. And so we had hypothesized going into the project that cohesive nationalism would have different effects than chauvinistic nationalism. And that co when, if we emphasize um, you know, different minority groups belonging to one Pakistani nation, we would decrease belief or suspicion um, or belief in misinformation, sorry, and suspicion of domestic minority groups. And so again, the idea being that if you promote the idea that all members belong to one like similar overarching community, bringing pride to the nation, that would make people feel more warmly, less suspicious of ethnic or sectarian others. What we found actually was that both types of nationalism had similar effects. And so even cohesive nationalism increased suspicion of minority groups, particularly those minority groups that were fighting for greater rights within Pakistan. So we're in the process of doing more research to uncover mechanisms for this effect, which we hadn't anticipated going in. And what we think might be happening is that when you prime people on nationalism, it increases the sense of pride one has in one's national identity. But when you are then faced with information about groups who are seeking greater rights within those confines, there's a backlash effect. And so we have to adjust, this made us adjust our priors and expectations a bit about how even inclusive nationalism or cohesive nationalism, and I recognize here that, that you know, we're not talking about exactly the same thing, right? Because your idea is about not a fixed identity, not necessarily an overarching identity, but um, an identity based on a value, right? Um, but, but nonetheless, whether this has downsides. And so I was wondering if we could think about, and I'll turn to you next, Dr. Tudor, um, to address this, but 
is there way are there ways in which even inclusive nationalist rhetoric can generate bad outcomes and particularly where does dissent fit in or resistance movements which is obviously a part of healthy democracy but perhaps it is antithetical to the notion of a nationalist project and we can think about that even in the concept context of the united states and um the black lives matter movement and so on ideas of model minorities right so is there a way in which inclusive nationalism can incorporate and have room for um, for dissent. So um, Dr. Tudor and then and then Ijasab. Dr. Siddiqui, thank you so much. That was actually a really fascinating set of kind of pearls of insights into this new project. And I um, I want to hear more about that. Bring up some really great points and I just want to I want to pick up on just a couple of them. So the first is that um, nationalism always has the potential to, potential to be exclusive towards outsiders in particular. And this is very much based on some of the research that you mentioned. So, you know, I, I think that the kind of the state of the art in social psychology as regards identity, my understanding of this is that, right, we all walk around and we have many identities that we that we feel are a part of us as individuals. Um, and that can be identities as families, as regions, in terms of religions, in terms of professions, right? The list is long. And um, that what identity is prominent in our thinking is very situational. So, um, you know, and, and, and part of the research that you talked about and the priming of how, what do you get people to think about? And then how do they react? Very much builds on that fundamental insight. Primarily, it's not the person, it's the situation that drives behavior. It's not a fundamental characteristic. It's who, who are you thinking you are um, at the moment that that behavior is, um, is instigated. So, um, so, but there, I think, I think that the, the research you talked about shows very much that nationalism can uh, come to, um, to bind people together. Um, and it does in some circumstances. And there's lots of great research about how um, victories and particularly in sports and Olympics, um, you know, in World Cup um, events um, end up having the effect of identifying individuals with the nation. So making that um, identity more salient. But, and I think this is where your research is, you know, really hits on something very crucial. And that is, you have to ask to begin with, how is the national identity constructed? So if the national identity, as I venture it, I would say it is in Pakistan, is closely identified with a region, with a, a, a religion, and frankly, a particular, you know, interpretation of religion, then that again creates outgroups. And so I'm not surprised to hear that in a sense, the different types of nationalism have similar effects because the kind of nation, the narrative of nation to use it, Jaws and, and you know, uh, Benedict Anderson's words, the kind of community that you are invoking has very specific connotations about who's in and who's out. Um, and I think, so your question to me, you know, to return to that with those marks was, can, can that national identity be actually um, be inclusive and, and how does dissent, dissent actually fit into that? I mean, I think that's where how the nation gets defined in terms of principles and values is really crucial. So, you know, there is an interpretation um, of, let's say, American nationalism. So the, I think that, again, the, the America's founding national narrative is a dual one, as Roger Smith wrote. It is one that absolutely has a sense of values and creeds and principles about who fits in. And at the same time, we know from its founding constitution that um, there is a very clear racial divide that has been there and has been continued from the founding of the, of, the, of the Republic to the present day. And those both get invoked and used by politicians, political entrepreneurs at various points in time. So, you know, there, but there is a version of it that has, as Martin Luther King did, as um, you know, women, women's rights advocates in the 1920s, uses that creedal nationalism to actually legitimate dissent. And so, and I think that, that what we see, for example, in India today is, is that that space, which is actually absolutely 
historically been a part of the Indian national narrative. What was the Gandhi inter interpretation of, of, na of Indian nationalism and nonviolence if but to interpret the, or to, to, to instantiate the right to dissent against unjust laws of government? That version of Indian nationalism has been um, almost entirely supplanted by one that closely marries religion with the identity of the nation. And we are seeing the effects of that um, as the, you know, as, as in huge numbers of, uh, of victims of violence are increasingly minorities. You always had violence, but now it's, it's much more targeted towards minorities than it has been in the past. And that is a direct consequence of the kinds of the particular type of nationalism. So I think in nationalism always has the potential to be exclusive towards outsider, but the important question to ask is how does it treat insiders? the citizens, the we. Um, and if it starts to rank the internal groups, that's when you start to get really problematic, I think, outcomes for democracy, which as you said, is a cluster concept, right? It's not one thing. And I just want to make one more comment on what, what Ajaz had said earlier, which is that, you know, when you think about this point of liberalism and democracy, I think, you know, Increasingly, democracy scholars have understood components of liberalism to fundamentally define democracy. So democracy is not just defined by elections, it's also defined by genuine competition and a genuine array of liberties that are protected. So I don't even think we need the, the kind of qualifier liberal democracy. I think we now just say democracy and these elements of democracy, competition, elections, and rights to dissent. And when those diminish, democracy itself is diminished. So I think, you know, there's this discussion of liberalism and democracy, but I think we increasingly understand that those, those rights have to be there for democracy itself to be meaningful. Yeah, those are um, really, really valuable points. Um, I wanted to, to respond to one thing just as, as a question and then um, and then I wanted to get a little bit specific because you mentioned India and Foxon and I, I think it'd be, you know, both our cases, um, that started off differently um, and have, have, have moved quite a bit from the founding direction in which they started, um, particularly India. But I, I wonder, and again, this is me pushing back as I think through my own research, um, is I wonder if this idea that you know, if nationalism can be um, potentially dangerous vis-a-vis -vis external um, uh, countries or identity groups, what happens when the domestic minority groups um, have this tie to this external group, right? So in the case of India and Pakistan, if Pakistan is viewed as an external country, um, foreign from India, that's one thing. But if Pakistan is tied to the identity of Islam, then what happens to Muslim minority groups within India, right? And so I wonder if there's a way in which the two become conflated in a which it's difficult for us to, to differentiate these nationalist strands entirely. Um, and this is more a question um, than a fully fledged thought, but I, I do wonder if there is something there. Um, did you want to respond to that or? Sure. Yeah. No, I think it's a really excellent point. I mean, and I think, I think it actually, um, it really makes I think this, this these points about what is the nature of national right? Nationalism itself, it's an imagined community, but the basis for imagining for most people is pretty thin, right? What is it? What what do we share as? Either Pakistanis or as Americans or as Germans. I mean, you know, you share some things, but you know, it's not a lot. So kind of what is the stuff that makes the nation meaningful? Um, and if that stuff, if that stuffing, if that connective tissue is actually fundamentally about religion in two countries that have, right, then, then I think that that's really, that ends up being very, very problematic. But I will say that you know, it's a tried and true tactic um, to take um, kind of dissent movements and link them to foreign enemies. So, you know, notably kind of Martin Luther King's civil rights movement in the United States was thought of as communist, it was regularly spoken about in the American uh, press uh, by opponents of civil rights movements as being kind of communist inspired. And so it sort of cast aspersions on the very right of those movements to exist. Um, and I think very similar things are happening in India today. So the, the, the very possibility of dissent 
right, is, is becoming so small uh, because if you dissent against the government, you are labeled with this word anti-national. Um, and, and so it, it has, that has the effect of polarizing even moderates who, who, you know, who, who might otherwise say, well, look, you know, we can agree to this. Um, fray becomes problematic, not only anti-national, but then you're a supporter of Pakistan and there's this kind of zero sum uh, relationship with that. And that, and, you know, that is problematic fundamentally for democracy because the space for dissent, which defines democracy, right? The right to dissent, the right to go out in a public space and say, I disagree. That is, is shrunk so radically um, in India um, today. We may be, you know, I mean, we may be at a turning point with that. We, we shall see um, at this moment, right? There's a, um, you know, the world is looking at a horrified eyes um, at India because we all know that India's crisis today might be our crisis tomorrow. And, um, uh, but I think we are seeing, um, you know, dissent from a broader range of quarters emerging right now um, in India. And, um, and they may be the beginning of the a kind of reclaiming of dissent across a broader spectrum. Um, at least I hope that that's a silver lining of, of these horrifying events. Yeah, I think um, I think that's very true, and I think it kind of links back to this idea that identity uh, and ultimately our own relationship with nationalism is situational, right? And so that it's it's it, it does make the the contours of it fuzzier as a result. Um, uh, Ijasab, I wanted to bring you into this discussion, and I wondered if you could offer your thoughts about the role of dissent um, in the nationalist project and whether there is room for it, um, and maybe looking at India and Pakistan specifically. Okay, thank you. Uh, but let me uh, first go back to uh, what Dr. Tudor said about the fact that, you know, when we talk about uh, liberal democracy, we can simply talk about it as democracy because unless you have, and you know, we've got a checklist there and those, you check those boxes and unless those boxes are checked, uh, you don't really have the kind of democracy that we want. But uh, with respect, I would say that one of the things that we are witnessing uh, in terms of rising nationalism, in terms of right-wing parties or demagogues or populists actually uh, winning elections, uh, the United States just had four years of President Trump. I think that there is need to not give a free pass to liberalism. And uh, while uh, you know, uh, I was listening to you, I just pulled out a quote uh, you know, Sheldon Wallen has probably uh, written the best critique of Rawls uh, on this point. And uh, he said, and I quote from what he, uh, what he wrote, Rawlsian justice thus faithfully mirrored contemporary liberalism's fundamental perplexity that despite constitutional guarantees of equal liberty and a dynamic economy that seemed not merely to promise but to deliver increase in prosperity and opportunities, social inequalities persisted and began to deepen. Now, we, and at the time that he was writing, at the time that uh, well, Wallen was writing, uh, we hadn't uh, seen the wheel coming full circle on this, this idea as we are witnessing now. And, and I also want to emphasize that it's not you know, what, we are, what we are seeing, uh, and I do believe that we are entering an age which is in a way different from say the mid 19th to mid 20th century. I mean, it, it's, it's like, you know, you go back to, uh, you know, see what Herzen or Bakunin uh, or Marx and others were writing, at least in terms of despondency or anger or, you know, a, a, a sentiment of revolt, so to speak, uh, that is there uh, as we speak. But we are also witnessing a different era and, and perhaps we can come back to this point, but I, I want to talk about the fact that it's not just a global age. We are entering a global digital age. And I think in many ways, uh, what we are entering into is something that perhaps in some ways would render what we are talking about somewhat passe. Uh, having said that, let me go back to the idea, of, and, and I, I also won't come back to Pakistan, uh, but let's, let's first discuss India. So we're talking about Hindutva. 
uh, we're talking about the fact that uh, this particular BJP government has created those markers and 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 you know and we also have to obviously distinguish between hinduism itself and hindutva as a as a political uh, nationalist project which i think is very important because these two cannot and must not be conflated um, but and this rok uh, leads up to the point that you were making which is an excellent point with reference to how you deal with your Indian Muslim minority in terms of, uh, you know, sort of conflating uh, or, or, you know, looking at them in terms of how India in a security paradigm looks at Pakistan and, and, you know, treating the Indian Muslim minority as people who are not patriotic, even though lots of them are in the Indian military or in the Indian administrative services and civil services uh, and, and, you know, uh, other and our government functionaries. So, and yet you, you begin to do that. And that is something which we have seen. Uh, it used to happen previously also, but now we have seen it happen as part of almost a government sponsored agenda. But, and I think this is an important point, even when there were Congress governments, even when there were secular governments, and despite what Dr. Ambedkar put in the Indian Constitution in terms of rights and, and principles, the approach of the Indian, successive Indian governments, as far as the Kashmiri Muslims in Indian occupied and now illegally in ex Kashmir are concerned, were no different. Uh, for instance, we talk about uh, revocation of Article 370. Uh, by this BJP government, uh, A.G. Nurani has written a definitive work on how 370 has been hollowed out over many years, starting in the 50s, immediately after it became part of the Indian constitution. Uh, how Pankaj Mishra has written, I mean, reported and written about the fact that, and he talks about the fact that this was a secular civilizing project, liberal civilizing project by the secular Indian government uh, in, in trying to subsume Kashmir into the Indian body politic. So my point is that uh, before we got to this, uh, this particular BJP government, even previous governments did have a particular minority, a particular state, which was considered as not being part of the matter narrative of the statist or nationalist narrative or conception of India, and therefore it needed to be civilized and brought in to the Indian uh, idea of Indianness. And the other thing uh, with reference to what we have witnessed in, in, in Pakistan, we have also tried to create certain markers. Uh, and unfortunately, it begins with the objectives resolution in 1948. Uh, and then of course, uh, we see a, a sort of movement towards bringing religion into, into politics, into uh, creating an identity, into creating a matter narrative of the state. Uh, and then we have the excommunication of the Ahmadiyya as part of the second amendment. And very recently uh, we have seen a particular group trying to exploit uh, a central tenet of, of uh, you know, being a Muslim, which is about the honor of the prophet uh, and, and using it to coerce a government, using it to, you know, become a political force. And I think that is the danger that is latent in, in uh, these exclusionary, uh, when you create these exclusionary markers, uh, religion is a very potent one, but so is uh, ethno-nationalism. Uh, the, you know, ethno-nationalism uh, is something that uh, we haven't really witnessed uh, in this part of the world, but Europe did, and, and it, it generated uh, terrible violence. Uh, you know, all one needs to do is, and, and Dr. Tudor was also talking about it, uh, all one needs to do is to read Hannah Arendt on, on uh, how that kind of violence is generated inside. And 
But the important question is, and, and to which Dr. Siddiqui, you pointed out, there is the external uh, adversary or an external competitor, a peer competitor or a rival. Um, and of course, you need your nationalism in order to contrast and in order to compete with that external uh, group, the, the, the uh, out group. But the important question is, how do you treat your own people? And I think that is where uh, post-colonial states have more been state nations rather than nation states, the more administrative units uh, as in terms of being a state rather than in terms of uh, having the ability to gel together and form some kind of supra identity. And when I say supra identity, by no means am I justifying, uh, you know, having a monolithic approach uh, or having a meta narrative or having the requirement for everyone to actually parrot that meta narrative. What I'm saying is that while Noam Chomsky, for instance, or while Chris Hedges or other critics uh, criticize uh, the US government policies, criticize uh, you know, whether those are internal policies, whether those are uh, foreign policies, they will never be confused about the sense of Americanism that they have. So what I'm saying is that that supra identity is, is, you know, you create a supra identity when regardless of whether you believe in the meta narrative in its entirety, regardless of whether you believe in certain aspects of that meta narrative, regardless of the fact that you do not believe in it at all and you want to have a different kind of narrative, you still want to be a Pakistan. That is an issue or that is an identity that you revere not because uh, there, is, there is external coercion for you to accept that, but because it, it inheres in you, you've internalized it. And I think the biggest challenge to me, uh, and I think that challenge now is, uh, is you know, sort of fast moving from the developing world to the more developed world also, the biggest challenge for any state is to be able to create that citizen which has spaces for dissent, uh, which is confident that even when she dissents, even when she says things that may not be in line with the meta narrative, uh, she can survive and she will not be, uh, you know, uh, sent to a re-education <laughs> camp or something. Uh, but but it, it all depends. And I think we all have our own histories. Uh, for instance, I've always found it, uh, you know, amazingly, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, almost ludicrous for China to have one time zone. I mean, it, 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 it's, like, it's like you are, uh, you've decided that in order to create some kind of national unity, you are even going to flout the, the rules of geography uh, and, and say, well, you know, we don't accept that we have six time zones or seven time zones. Uh, your watches are going to be exactly uh, where they are, whether you are in East China, whether you're in West China. So, so the point really is that, uh, for instance, for someone like me, that's not, that's not a place that I want, uh, would like to, or that's not the kind of system that I would like to have where I am being, uh, where there's a, you know, as I talked about the digital age, and I hope we can actually discuss that because that is now, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, and, you know, an era which is of great interest to me, uh, even though I'm a Luddite, uh, certified Luddite, but, but I, I, I keep <laughs> reading up, uh, that's an occupational hazard. The fact is that you, you have social credit uh, now. You, you get points. And if you lose points, you'd probably not be able to have, uh, you know, uh, get into an airplane and travel from uh, one city to another. And there's so many other convenience that, uh, conveniences that you will not have. And this reminds me of that great sort of dialogue between Mustafa Mond and John the Savage in Huxley's Brave New World where Mustafa Mon says, well, we've created a world which, which has so many conveniences. 
you don't get sick you don't uh, it's great you have all the comforts in the world and john the savage is not convinced he says i want to be sick i want to uh, be me and i want to be free so it's essentially about how do you want what kind of system do you want to live in and i once again uh, i think i've uh, overshot my time uh, that that you know you you really the challenge really is to be able to create spaces for dissent and at the same time have citizens that really are proud of the identity that they have or multiple identities for that matter as sen talks about you know you can be so many different people in terms of your various associations yeah so a lot of really many fruitful avenues for discussion further discussion there so let me pick up on two of them um so I want to get to the digital age which um was brought up uh, but first I wanted to talk a little bit more about this um you know it just talked about this um Dr. Trudy you you alluded to it initially and I know your research centers on this a little bit so you know when we talk about India we see this move um of even entrenched inclusive democracy towards more exclusive notions of nationhood right and we're seeing that unfold right now so I wanted um to get your thoughts on like the process by which that happens but also the 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 flip side of that right so how difficult is a move from exclusive nationalism to inclusive nationalism and you argue for example that Pakistan was founded on the basis of exclusive nationalism by your definition the fact that it was based on a religious identity i think is clear right so what are the possibilities of a move away from this um do you think and then um, once I get your thoughts on that, then I want to turn back to the digital age question. Sure. No, I think this is a hugely important question, especially for, for Pakistan. I think it's worth really meditating upon that because I, I think what we've all been talking about for the last, you know, oh, 45 minutes um, is, is exactly this issue of, of the relationship between nationalism and democracy. And I think that a core of what we all agree on is the space for dissent and the ways in which if it gets, if any national identity gets too closely tied to a fixed identity, then that, and that does invariably down the road create greater opportunities for quashing dissent structurally. So I really, you know, and, and to be, founding shadows are hard to, to jettison because but at the same time to um to i think rephrase something that ajaz said and you know only ajaz can you know talk about chomsky and arendt and and uh, renan and all the you know and throw those in casually during a kind of five ten minute chat um but but i think you know you mentioned Ar renan's you know a quote about all nations selectively remember and forget so nations are always in a process of kind of making and remaking their history. Um, and, you know, there is agency in that. Um, and I think that there are really specific questions about where do we learn about who the we is, right? The, the, the place, the first place where people tend to learn about the nation they belong to is school. Um, you may hear about it from your family, uh, but it's often hard as a child to disentangle, disentangle um, family from kind of broader society. It's when you sort of leave the home and in those formative years, you begin to understand through history textbooks taught in school, through practices of um, how people are treated, um, the, the stories, the myths that get founded, the national holidays that are celebrated. But the good news about that part of it is that those are, are can be and are continually rewritten, right? Um, it, stories that you know, 40 years ago told taught children the United States was founded by Columbus now tell a very, very different story about the the role of natives peoples and the extermination of that, and at the same time do that delicate balance of saying at the same time we can be proud of something that we all share while acknowledging the ugly warts and the violence that inevitably accompanies the birth of nations. So I think that's one. Um, I think another kind of, um, uh, you know, really specific question you asked was, um, was about how, how difficult is that transition? And I think one thing I said, it's, it's difficult, but it's, that doesn't mean it's a one country that has relatively recently traveled that road has been Canada. 
Um, and why, why did Canada travel that road? It traveled that road because of an existential crisis. It's hard to remember how close the Quebec um, community came to succeeding from Canada. And um, it came within, a, you know, tenths of a percentage point of succeeding in a, in a referendum for, for independence. And um, it, it was the threat of a kind of a separate Quebec that um, motivated the senior uh, Prime Minister Trudeau to say, oh, you're Quebec Canadian? Well, um, we are, here is the Chinese Canadians and there are native Canadians. And he sort of uh, initiated this process of transforming what was a Canadian nest that was very closely identified with race, just in the same way that American a national identity identified with kind of you know whiteness, which itself is an invented term, um, and that that was transformed into a kind of hybrid national identity where everyone the acknowledgement was there that everyone has multiple identities, but that doesn't, as as you yourself said, Dr. Siddiqui, you know, um, invalidate the kind of commonness of that superordinate national identity. In fact, what it requires is thickening that sense of principles and creeds, giving it form and shape and celebration, and imagining in, in the minds of those school children that are first learning about the national identity. But it is a hard one and few nations um, have traversed it. Yeah, I think those are um, really, you know, really central points and kind of, um, you know, you're, you initially talked about moments of crisis, right, and how they're, they're key. Um, and it makes me wonder if there is a, you know, whether a peaceful route towards a change from exclusive to inclusive is really feasible, right? And and I don't mean peaceful as in, like, I'm not talking about civil war necessarily, but I wonder, you know, so I'll, in the United States, you know, when the election happened um, last year, it was a very critical moment, right? A lot of people um, were thinking revolution, they were thinking violence, um, and the fact that it didn't turn out as badly as we had suspected doesn't mean that the threat really wasn't there, right? And so I think I, I was teaching a course on violent political conflict, you know, maybe five years ago, I wouldn't have expected a course entitled Violent Political Conflict to be primarily about the United States. But in fact, we often started off the class by talking about the United States. And what I'm seeing right now sitting in Albany, New York is a very, very divided populace, right? And so we have these, the move of people, a large group of people, my social circle, right? So the people that I follow on Twitter, all of them are moving towards a much more inclusive, the idea of you know, um, nationalism is just is changing in a lot of ways, but only under certain in certain cir circles and among others, it just seems to be strengthening in a different direction. Right. And so these schisms that occur in society between whatever, right, the liberal elite in Fox Sun versus the others or what whatever these schisms are, they seem to be often about what the future direction of the nation is or ought to be. And it makes me sometimes a little pessimistic because, um, you know, the idea of, I completely agree with you, the idea of transforming the textbook is so central, um, but it just doesn't seem, it seems like a very difficult, in a lot of these contexts, it seems very a difficult hurdle to overcome, um, to be able to, to instigate or instill these changes um, at that fundamental level, because it's so wrapped up in a status quo, right? And the powers that be that benefit from that status quo. Um, but okay, so um, I wanted to, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. I'm also getting a, a bunch of very interesting questions from the audience. So um, luckily some of the questions are questions that I wanted to pose anyway. So let me take one. Um, and and I, I do promise, I do want to return to this idea again of um, you know nationhood in the digital age. But since we're talking about this anyway, in terms of backsliding and um, populism. So we have a question from uh, Dr. Farhan Hanif Siddiqui. And he asks, uh, what is the relationship between nationalism and populism? Does it make sense to speak of a populist nationalism which undermines democracy and representation? Um, and that's that's a great question. In my notes, I had, do you differentiate between populism and nationalism? So I think this is an important question. Um, what do you, you know, in this con in this context of nationalism, if you could talk a little bit about the rise of populism today. Um, and again, like we're seeing it in a bunch of countries in South Asia as well. So how do you think that, um, how do you think that relates to these ideas of inclusive versus exclusive nationalism? Um, and where is this rise coming from? What can we do to arrest it? Or is it even a trend we need to arrest? Um, so first, uh, Dr. Tudor, and then we'll move on. 
Exactly. That's a really fantastic question. So I think, you know, I define populism, and I, I think this is generally shared, um, as a kind of a, a rhetorical tool which pits a kind of opposition between a corrupt elite that stands in the way of a people who, that is pure, um, the people is often, you know, is the nation. So there's a, there's a link between the two, again, structurally. Um, but that it, it's, it's kind of a rhetorical uh, technique, right? Because you have to ask yourself, if this is the problem, if the corrupt elite are the problem and the people are the solution, structurally, what's to happen in a democracy? And I think people don't often think about walking down the road of consequences um, if, if the problem is posed as the elite. Um, is the problem the wiping out of the elite? Is the problem the underdoing, uh, the, the doing away of the elite? And, and actually, typically leaders who are elected with populist tactics, and it doesn't have to be from the right. I'm currently writing a paper comparing the emergency and democratic backsliding in that moment with um, the democratic backsliding in India today and what's shared and what's, you know, what's different. What's absolutely shared is a kind of po po an invocation of populism and, and the elite is corrupt and the people is pure. But where does that lead you to is that the great leader um, is the solution to the problem, right? The great leader stands apart from the elite um, and the great leader should therefore sweep away all constraints that are of course uh, pushed by elites, the elite, elite um, uh, kind of staffed constraints, institutional constraints on, on democracy and the consolidation of power in that individual. So whether it's on the left or on the right, the kind of invocation of populism often leads down the primrose path towards the undermining of democracy. And in particular, the sweeping away of any kind of constraints on the, the, the power of the great leader. So I do think the answer to the question um, that, there is a, um, that, that there is a real danger in terms of, of the, the kind of populism we're seeing that the solution to that can eventually be the undermining of democracy. That doesn't have to be the case though. And I think, again, as we've, we've already been saying, um, claiming the space for people to dissent and to have different views on what should be done is a first step in averting that kind of off-ramp towards you know, the road towards authoritarianism. I think you also asked a really important question. I think it touches a little bit actually on some of the questions that Ijaz wanted to talk about in terms of digital, digital democracy. What is driving um, the, the kind of rise of populism and the rise of right, kind of populist leaders. And I think there's there some, some interesting um, kind of uh, cross fertilization between these two questions. So, uh, you know, it's undoubtedly the case that we're seeing, we have been seeing, and it, this is as true um, of kind of Europe and America as, as it is of, of kind of the Indias and the Pakistans of the world, you are seeing, you know, regional movements, caste-based movements, race-based movements, you've essentially seen the rise of identity politics um, that in various shapes and forms, and it differs by region and by country, um, that has challenged kind of the power of majorities um, and also the cultural capital of majorities in some ways. And that has led, I think, to kind of a, 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 a majoritarian nationalism that's on the right, that's been part of it. Now, another part of it has been the, the ability of some of these great leaders to reach out directly to the people through unmediated tweets and um, and posts on 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 social media platforms. So you know that is that has aided this, but I think it's also important to say that um, it hasn't entirely created this, right? We again we saw that again, you know, in the 1970s, the emergency um, came about as the result of in, sort of similar structural tensions without, you know, digi the digital tools that we are experiencing, the kind of digital revolution um, is in some ways exacerbating these tendencies towards populism um, because it's offering up new tools. But at the same time, I think it's really common to say that we live in an entirely new world. The world is just a different world, uh, unrecognizable to the past. And I think, um, I actually think we live in the same world, but a world in which a variety of biases that we all have as humans has been 
deeply accentuated. And the most important of those is the confirmation bias. So we all tend to think we're right. We all have, right? We all have a kind of monopoly on the truth, we think. Um, and and it's, it's a natural human tendency to interpret information in such a way that it supports your view, your preconceived view. Um, but we now live in an age where we have these algorithms that really feed you views that confirm these pre-existing views that you have and in which we, they are these many of these social media platforms are based upon a business model in which the more time you spend on their platforms, the more money they make. And what that means is that they're highly incentivized to provide you with slightly more polarizing views because that is what gets you to click and stay on the platform. And the consequence of that is for democratic politics is actually really deep because there's less discussion of different views. Um, there are less people who you sit in a virtual room with who have different opposing, much less, you know, di or different, much less opposing views from you. Um, there's no genuine questioning and debate in which we have to grapple with these views. And I think we're more likely to be strident in those platforms because there is no in-person moderation. So on an individual level, I think what that means is that we're all, our abilities to say, huh, that's really interesting. I might be wrong, or I would be wrong if these things were true and we can agree on an independent arbiter of truth, those things are all disappearing. And the, the, the repercussions of those developments for the polarization of our views is very serious indeed. Yeah, I think that's completely right. Um, I think that, you know, that's, in a sense, when I was talking about this, you know, even my social media bubble is exactly what you're getting at, right? So this idea that we all have this confirmation bias is so central. Um, and I, my interest in misinformation kind of stems from this, right? Because it's this idea that, you know, motivated reasoning, we see what we want, we believe what suits our existing priors, right? So where we where you stand is where you sit. Um, and so um, the, the concept of truth itself becomes um, up for interpretation with um, the ways in which, um, you know, uh, you know, populism or democracy even filters through in this like, direct leader to, um, to citizen um, process that we seem to be in. Um, and then just a side point that uh, this idea of left wing versus right wing populism, I think is, is a really important one and something that we don't really think about because we tend to conflate populism with right wing populism. And um, so this, the paper that you're writing sounds completely fascinating. Um, so Ijasab, I'd, I'd, I'd love to bring you in here. Um, I, you know, so just going back to the original question from Dr. Farhan Siddiqui about populism and democracy, but also your response to Dr. Tudor's thoughts about um, the ways in which, um, you know, digital democracy and um, the, the presence of these social media outlets, um, how they affect our approach to these issues because of confirmation bias and the ways in which these algorithms bring in information in a particularly, um, you know, uh, a, a way that's particular to the consumer. Um, so if you could take three or four minutes to address that. Okay, thanks. Uh, so Dr. Tudor has already very eloquently uh, talked about it. So let me let me try to sail this from, from a different perspective. So uh, you've got to have a story. Uh, democracy, nationalism, uh, these are all stories uh, because we need stories in order to uh, make sense of not just our individual selves, but also the collection that we are a part of. So the whole idea of creating a system where uh, you are not tyrannized by the majority is A, uh, not natural, and B, uh, it requires a very convincing story, and three, that story sh should be able to uh, fulfill the empirical test. Now, if you do not have uh, that story, if more and more people come to realize, rightly or wrongly, that the story is not fulfilling uh, that, that dream, the story is not to be understood in the way it is being presented, and then if someone comes along, uh, the great leader or a particular party led by a great leader and gives another story which appeals to, uh, to populism and 
I would say that the moment we talk about populists, we are actually talking about majoritarians. Because populism, because most of the societies and states in the world are not homogenous. They, they, they have different ethnic groups. Uh, it, the, the diversity obviously varies from one to another, but, but all are uh, in some way or the other diverse. So, so that, uh, one, of the, one of the ideas, uh, and I think this, this has been practiced through history, is almost runs like a motif, where the demagogue or the great leader makes the majority feel that the majority is under threat from a minority or multiple minority groups. And therefore, the majority needs to assert itself or reassert itself. And I think that is where the populist uh, idea comes. And uh, from where I stand, uh, I consider it as something which is ultimately the unraveling of democracy in terms of constitutional protections. Uh, you may still have democracy in terms of numbers. You may still have democracy in terms of uh, electoral cycle, uh, but it will certainly not be a democracy where unless you are part of the majority that you would consider yourself to be an equal citizen or whether you would consider yourself safe to be able to, uh, to you know, offer dissent or, or, you know, this can also get very ugly as we have seen through history uh, and, and most probably, unfortunately, we would see it again also. Now, uh, as far as the, the digital side of it is concerned, I think uh, this has happened in the pre-digital age also, uh, disinformation or misinformation, but uh, in the digital age, uh, the, the sheer, uh, you know, explosion of information, uh, it obviously uh, relies on the confirmation bias, uh, as has been said, or what Kahneman would say, uh, you know, the difference between fast and slow thinking. So you have your predisposition. So heuristics is obviously the best way to go about deciding uh, for a course of action. And in many ways, it is something useful. But in other cases where you need to uh, deeply analyze something, where you need to take a pause and say, hold on, I'm not going to respond immediately. I'm going to think this through. And, and I think, and, and you know, it's easier said than done. Uh, even those of us who have consciously tried to train themselves to try and get out of this cage of confirmation biases and, and predisposition, uh, fall prey to it. And, and I mean, personally, I've fallen prey to it when I'm on, uh, on Twitter. It, it, there is something really sinister about the platform itself because it, it's almost like you see something and you want to just respond to it. And, and I think that's the, that's the worst thing that one can do. On top of that, you obviously have troll farms. Uh, you now have uh, bots, uh, being uh, you know, uh, using artificial intelligence, uh, where uh, you you create information or you analyze big data, and you then present it in ways uh, which target uh, uh, you know uh, sections of the population through what we now call influence operations. Uh, you, you know, Netflix has a, has a full documentary on Cambridge Analytica, how, how it, uh, it, it sort of, you know, tried to influence the 2016 uh, U.S. election. Uh, there's yet another documentary on Netflix, uh, which interviews, uh, you know, uh, people who were part of uh, these tech giants and to see how these tech giants create, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Tudor talked about the algorithm. I mean, the algorithm is something which is, is now governing our lives. I mean, Kathy O'Neill, a fantastic mathematician, wrote this brilliant book. I mean, I, I, and you know, one of my uh, friends who's a mathematician gave that book to me, and I, I remember reading it while traveling from Islamabad to, to Lahore, and it's titled Weapons of Mass Destru Destruction. And, and it's about big data and how big data is utilized 
not to you know remove inequalities but to actually perpetuate them so 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 i think we we as i said earlier uh, i would have said that we are getting into a cycle but i i believe that we are now getting into an age where there are other uh, forces that are going to work in ways that perhaps some of the categories that we're talking about uh you know uh, would become outmoded i mean look at how the tech giants are we uh, i i have become hackable uh you know uh, the tech giant knows about me and my preferences uh, more than uh, i know myself so so which is why i always recommend uh, you know i tell people to keep a light uh, digital uh, footprint but imagine when this information technology is wedded to biotechnology uh you already do not have the option of staying outside of this because uh, governments want you uh, look at your cnic i mean in pakistan which has a chip there uh, you already part of that system and 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 so therefore you are you you know the governments can control you and this will only increase and there there's no escaping it uh, and i think there is reason for us to be concerned about the fact that this entire idea of democracy that we are talking about is not just under pressure and under threat from some of those factors that we have discussed up, up until now but also because of the digital age in which we are entering thank you Yeah, a little bit of a pessimistic picture, but a lot to agree with there. Um I I had a very a very interesting question. So I wanted to switch gears, obviously related, but it's a question from uh Kashun Liza and the question is um in Modi's India today exclusive nationalism is clearly on the rise. In March this year, uh the Sweden-based Videm report dropped India from electoral democracy to electoral autocracy. The Indian politicians are slamming the report, calling it the hypocrisy of the western world. how do you see the dichotomy of views and then this is a really i think a really key point can the measures for democracy be redefined should they be redefined in contemporary times dr tudor i think this is addressed to you yeah look i mean there's no question that we need to have measures of democracy and you might quibble about the existing measures but i think the onus is on the quibblers to say what is a good measure of democracy right because i think we do need to live in a world where we are able to say this is this country is is creating space for dissent it is allowing competition to emerge and i think um you know having been a part of a couple of those conversations on twitter among other platforms and um, it's it's i i think you know there are some maybe some legitimate complaints about this particular part of that index um but there's no one there who very seriously doubts that for example dissent in india and the space board has declined there is no you know there's no um serious uh, d- uh i think uh rejoinder to the fact that power has been heavily centralized since 2014 in the prime minister's office in india in a way that is fundamentally new and that poses a threat to democracy so it's not just vdem it was also freedom house that did it um you know and and so i guess i guess i don't think that those you know i have served in other years as advisors to um a couple of these organizations um i think those are very robust but i think again here's where you know let's be specific if the problem was with some of those indicators what what is the problem and and more importantly what's the solution right because it's easy to say well that's problematic but it's you know where do we go from here and i think that's where we need to have some 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 real um discussion but if i want to i just want to say one or two points about some i think really interesting things that that um and jazz had had raised so i think one is um you i think you were talking about the social dilemma the netflix documentary um which which profiles a number of the founders of these algorithms and social media companies um i made my children watch it and you know i think The reason I mention this is because um I do I have a, a little more of an optimistic view um of where this is going in the future. I and I think we are we are um at a really bad place right now and there's no and we need to recognize that in terms of 
these algorithms and the ways in which um, you know, 20 or 200 likes on, on some platform will give a company enough of a profile that they know you better than your spouse does. Um, it's a profoundly scary idea, but I also think once you know that is true, there are beginning to be tools to, um, to change that. It's become, you know, I spent two, two years, a year and a half ago in Silicon Valley you know, people are increasingly turning off their notifications. They are going, you know, incognito when they search. Um, there is going to be regulation. There already has been in Europe. That, um, and I think that this, you know, it's coming. And I think di digital natives, um, uh, like like my children, the next generation, um, you know, they are they are creating some norms to opt out of some of these things. Norms are not enough. In the end, it has to be regulation. It has to be governments that, that move in that direction. But I do see some hopeful signs on this, um, not, not, to, uh, not to undermine the very seriousness of, of I think, what's, what's going on um, behind the scenes in some of these companies. But I think the one last thing I wanted to say was, you know, I just, just reflecting on the earlier question, it strikes me um, about how, how countries change and how you curate these inclusive narratives, it strikes me that one thing we haven't talked about in this conversation so far is about the power of organization, right? We talked about nationalism and democracy and social media. And, and, and I think, you know, um, the, the power of organization is something we are seeing playing out in India right now. Um, there is a fundamental asymmetry between the pol political parties and who is organized, right? By some count, um, the RSS is the most organized kind of um, non-governmental organization, if you can classify it as that, right, um, in the world that holds thousands of daily meetings. Right? So, so let's not forget that the power to organize is always in our hands, but in the long term, these organizations have to be built. And, you know, some of these Hindu nationalist organizations spent 80 years in the political wilderness and have built up a, you know, very robust um, organizational base. Um, and that can be done for other organizations. But I think right now we're at a place, particularly in the tech sectors, where we've seen, um, we tend to see, I've seen some um, data which suggests that right-wing organizations um, have a two to one organizational advantage now um, on social media. But you know that is changed, they have a first mover advantage, um, that may change. So yeah, I think um, I think I think it's, you're right that we haven't spoken about organizations, um, both both political and civil society, right? So both types, um, but also you know the 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 raising of the idea of norms, I think, has been kind of implicit in our discussion without actually being raised, right? So like, how do norms change? Is kind of the question we're asking. Um, in a lot of ways when we think about movement from types of nationalisms. And, and I think this point that that needs to be backed up by regulations and laws is really important. And we see it play up again and again in Pakistan, right? Where we have norms, but laws are in place. And those once the laws are in place, they're hard to revoke. And so it creates this path dependent in nature um, to what we, to what, where we are at. And I think that's very important. Um, so I have time for one last question, and it's gonna, I'm gonna ask you guys, both of you to be very brief, but I, I you know, it, it doesn't seem right. Um, to be sitting here talking about South Asia um, and not talk about uh, COVID-19, um, given both what is unfolding in India um, to a greater extent than what is unfolding in Pakistan, but also the role of social media. Um, at least, you know, what I have been seeing is the, the coming together of civil society to kind of fill in um, in a way that the government has been unable to, right? So seeking oxygen sources, finding people, hospital beds, and just, it's a, and, and I think it kind of poses a, a, a counterpoint to the conversation we've been happening, having of the, the downsides, right? Of, 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 of digital, um, the digital life that we live now. Um, so I, I was wondering then on the, so again, just a couple of, of minutes for each of you, what does this crisis that we are currently undergoing, how does this affect, um, do you think, um, maybe particularly in India, but the future of, um, of the type of nationalism that we're seeing there and of the current government and the notion of future democracy um, and all the different schisms we have, right? Class schisms, ethnic, religious, and so on. Like, is this a crisis point that's going to make change um, in the near term, in the long term? Um, or is this something that you think that the current institutions are, are robust to? 
So Dr. Tudor and Ifijaz Sabi, if you want to go straight up afterwards and then we'll pass it off to Omar for the final words. Right. So um, we're absolutely living at a crisis point. It's not just in India, just not in, just in South Asia. Um, we are seeing, I think, uh, uh, we, none of us have escaped, right? Over the last year and a half, we have all stood by and seen our national leaders with a backdrop of flags in the background, announcing unheard of restrictions in peacetime um, for almost all of us. And that I think has power of the nation state. This is a virus that began globally and global companies and um, uh, supply chains that are global um, for the manufacture of vaccines. So we are, you know, it is, it is, I think it is absolutely underscoring the role of nation states and how they define our um, experience of COVID um, and how they define our experience of recovery. Um, and at the same time, I think that the, the crisis has created an expanded role for government, and particularly in places like the United States, where you know, day after day, we're seeing announcements of, an, of a kind of a government. In India in particular, um, I think it has highlighted the downsides of a kind of, in, of a, an increasingly authoritarian system, right? I mean, it, this is a, a, a country that, um, you know, second waves, third waves were cascading around the globe. It was utterly predictable um, that a, a second or third wave would come to India. Where was the government of maximum governance um, at that time? You know, it, it certainly wasn't prepared. And I think, um, you know, when a government is focused on kind of the politics of identity and the politics of ideology, that tends to happen. Go ahead. Uh, you asking me? Ah, okay. Uh, so, so I think the the jury is uh, out on this because uh, there's a paradox. Uh, when something like this happens, uh, at one level, uh, you sort of uh, you know uh, close in, uh, you build the walls. At another level, you need to have uh, cross-border, transnational cooperation in order to address this. In India, what we have seen is kind of ironic. Uh, there was footage from Gujarat, uh, Muslim organizations. Uh, it's the same place where in 2002, uh, let's not forget, there was a Muslim pogrom uh, on the watch of uh, the current Indian Prime Minister, uh, Narendra Modi. Uh, Muslim organizations. Uh, Tablizi Jamaat uh, was the entire Indian media uh, had declared the Tablizi Jamaat as super spreaders. Uh, they're the ones who have been denoting plasma, helping, uh, you know, sending ambulances, uh, ditto for jamaat islami Hind. Uh, Sikh Gurdwara, another minority uh, in Delhi, uh, by all accounts, uh, that is where you go if you, if you need an oxygen cylinder. So uh, whether the, the, the majority and within the majority, the ideologues of Hindutva, whether they consider this, uh, as something which will change their perception of the, the minorities uh, remains to be seen. Uh, my own sense is that it's unlikely to, uh, to change because uh, once things return to normal, once there is adversity, uh, you, you will seek help from anyone. But once things go back to normal, uh, humans have this uh, terrible habit of uh, falling back on old habits and bad habits. So, uh, as I said, the jury is out. We'll have to wait and see uh, which way this goes. Thank you so much. I, I am being told that I need to unfortunately end this conversation and move it back um, to Ipri for the closing remarks. Um, I personally have learned so much. I wish we could talk um, for another hour and a half. Um, there's so many questions that your responses have raised. I'm sure everybody agrees. Um, so again, for me, thank you so much. I um, really look forward to continuing these conversations offline. Um, Omar, I'm passing it on to you. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Siddiqui. I would now request Brigadier Rashid Wali Janjua, Acting President of PRI, to uh, give his concluding remarks. Thanks, Over Omar. Years. Thanks, Omar. And I would uh, once again like to uh, thank the participants. I think uh, one of the great conversations that I've heard in recent times. 
and uh, with a surgical scalpel like precision uh, dr tudor ejaz and nilofar have completely unpacked and laid bare the lineaments of uh, democracy and its linkage with the nationalism <laughs> and i think uh, the three quick takeaways uh, i'd like to uh, mention one is uh, what ejaz hadar mentioned that tensions in here in both these concepts and these tensions need to be moderated through the force of civic nationalism and the ability to uh, claim a space for dissent for the population is the binding and the healing glue of that civic nationalism the second point is that uh, how these nationalisms are the national identities and which ultimately comprise nationalism are constructed the example of indian nationalism is apposite here wherein one was a nehruvian secular nationalism based on civic nationalism and the civic nationalism was based on equal rights sovereignty you know uh, and uh, the rights of the marginalized on equal footing with the elite so that was a nationalism which came slowly into conflict with another kind of nationalism which was based on hindutva religious nationalism its concept of exclusivism and uh, in its worst form bordering on xenophobia so uh, i think the binding glue and the healing touch of civic nationalism is the you know uh, bind is what is the magic bullet that is needed to link these both concepts nationalism and uh, democracy uh, in a complementary form rather than uh, acting as a divisive force i would like to conclude by uh, saying that uh, most of us have uh, heard about uh, huntington and his clash of civilization but little is talked about is another book who are we in which he gave a very important concept that is not the clash of civilization but the clash between civilization and the barbarisms now to my mind what mitigates what moderates what softens what provides the healing touch to those barbarisms is the civic nationalism equal rights law constitutionalism liberal democracy in the vein of what uh, farid zakaria talks of illiberal democracy that democracy sans its substance just comprising its uh, you know form is of no use and uh, if we have those constitutional constitutional liberalism functioning courts effective legislatures and institutions that give voice to the marginalized i think they that undergirds the edifice of civic nationalism and uh, that is what will bring a very important linkage between democracy and nationalism and uh, that would be a win win formulation for the concept so uh, in conclusion i thank uh, all the worthy uh, distinguished panelists for a very engaging and absorbing discussion i thank you all um ladies and gentlemen this brings us to the end of today's lecture uh, once again um thank you to the uh, three panelists dr tudor dr siddiqui and mr ejaz hader for a very fascinating uh, discussion um uh, please follow us on our official social media pages to stay updated with our research activities uh, thank you take care goodbye